Welcome to Dividend Talk episode 177, a reflection on the year, our quarter 4 2023 performance and live questions from some of our most loyal followers. Dividend Talk is your number one podcast for all things dividend and stock market related with a unique European flavor. My name is Derek from Engineer My Freedom and I'm joined with my co-host European DJI. If you want to learn more about us, please visit europeandji.com where we have articles on dividend growth investing, including 30 European dividend aristocrats. While you're there, you might as well grab our free dividend portfolio tracker template. We also offer a premium dividend growth service featuring a bi-weekly newsletter which includes stock deep dives, dividend stock cards and access to our dashboard with over 130 dividend growth stocks. All of this is based on our very own dividend safety analysis. But enough about that, please grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. European DJ, happy Christmas. How how's your week been? Really, really good. I mean, it's almost happy New Year for you and for me. But uh, I'll forgive you. Now it's been really good. Uh, been visiting my family, stuffing myself with food, of course, uh, getting some presents, also some socks. So uh, you know, always like who your enemy is when you get a pair of socks for Christmas. Uh, well, I know again this uh, uh, by now. But uh, yeah, it's been really good, really good. And I'm really looking forward for the new year, uh, 2024. For me, 2023 is almost closed uh, in my mind already. I just need to finish and write my annual report, which I will hopefully publish by next Saturday somewhere, depending on uh, how much time I spend on the newsletter as well in the meanwhile. Um, yeah, really looking forward because it's been a great year and I only want more, of course. I'm, I'm greedy when it comes to dividend income. But how about you? Yeah, it's been it's been quite a week. Um, you know, in Ireland, the best way we socialise is in the pub. So <laughs> we spent pretty much a whole week either travelling or in in the pub. So it's a, I can't I can't actually wait to go back to work. It'll be a break. <laughs> that's, so that's it's a it's Guinness. Right? Yeah, Guinness, Guinness. Hey, look, the Azure shareholders will will hopefully thank me. Uh, but this is a special episode for us. We've got lots of beautiful faces looking at us. Um, usually it's just just me and you. So I'm, I'm quite looking forward to engaging with with some of the people here from from our community. And it, it's going to be uh, quite an awesome, awesome show. And we're going to look back aren't we, over over the year and see bits yeah. that bits that we thought was good, what we reflected on and, and maybe look at our portfolio performance over the last three months as well. So I'm quite excited for this. Good. So, hey, talking about that, then let's. If you think about 2023, right? And there was so much news this year. It was a crazy year. I saw one of the stock market predictions from, you know, at the start of 2023 that this would be a bad year. And then what was it? The S&P 500 does a 20 percent or something like that. It's just yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. So, if you think about this, like, what what did stand out for you this year? If you really look at the news uh, yeah. from an investing point of view. Yeah, there's been there's been so many, but like we've spoke about, kind of expecting a crash and waiting for a trigger point, and and I remember it seems so long ago now, but remember when the banks started to go, so Silicon Valley yeah. Bank was was that, and we were wondering was that the trigger point? Is is now going to be the time we get this big crash that we're waiting for? And it didn't, but it was like that seems so 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 far in the distance when when that happened. The CEO, if I remember at the time, sold maybe three four million of his shares about two weeks before it happened. Yeah, and and then it was like a domino effect. There was two or three other banks that, that started to go, but nothing really materialized from that. It seemed to recover quicker than than I anticipated, anyway. Well, but the great thing was it gave us good opportunities in the insurance sector, right? Because it went down with the financial sector. So I've been loading up a lot on an N Group, ASR, as an example, because they became overnight so cheap yeah, compared it's... to what they traded before. Yeah, and, and I look at my portfolio waiting before, and if you remember last year, I was consumer staples was always my top dog, but thirty percent. But I've been loading up on financial services. That's now thirty percent of my portfolio. Wow! So, 
but you have wow. to you, you have to take advantage don't you when 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 there's opportunities yeah. you have to you have to take them oh yeah no definitely and uh, talking about opportunities sometimes it's also just pure misery for, because for me 2023 was the year of litigation 3m pfas buyer look at what buyer is trading right now in the in the <laughs> low 30s yeah still with this roundup uh here johnson johnson, johnson. johnson settling uh as well i mean there is something at the moment that, and even google i think that uh, this week in the news a five billion settlement or something like that it, it's like these big companies you know i think we need to start looking at capital allocation not anymore from share buybacks and dividends but just dividends share buybacks and litigation because i think there's just a cost to 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 being a big company L also look at alibaba what they did right at the time they also um i said started paying uh, uh, to the social fund or something like that to to support china kind of buying off uh, <laughs> that they will be prosecuted or or shut down or something like that i don't know exactly how it works there but it has been just litigation everywhere and not just like 10 million here 5 million there it's, it's like multi billions it's insane almost yeah walgreens i i keep going back to walgreens because they're a big part of my portfolio but they paid 44 million 45 million um for this tanners remember this uh yeah. bad blood book um yeah so there's just been billions and billions of money just been paid on litigation this year it's been it's actually been crazy it seems every company yeah. we talk about there's some sort of lawsuit coming up against them yeah and then, but i think most money goes to the governments right i've never had as a shareholder or as an individual citizen suddenly uh, a check in my uh, mailbox saying like wow hey you got the you were your mother was using talc powder uh, for 40 years ago here you've got your share back because you might get cancer <laughs> yeah <laughs> never seen this never seen this no no not at all but yeah it's been it's been in terms of litigation we have nn group as well um oh yeah forgetting about those um yeah, and asr asr yeah. but asr kind of navigate that quite well they were never really in trouble were they um whereas yeah. nn group seemed to be more in the news and then we had microsoft closing their their long anticipated deal with with activision that was that was quite big because i remember at the time there was a huge gap in the share price of activision because nobody knew if it would be approved. Mm -hmm. um, there was quite an opportunity there, which I know some of our community took advantage of. They had managed to buy Activision at a, at a pretty reasonable price, around $70, $70. And yeah. I think the deal was around $90. So it was quite an opportunity there that if you took the risk, would have paid off yeah. handsomely. But, but for me, Microsoft, I mean, look at how diversified it is. It's not just any more Windows and Office product, right? It's the cloud business artificial intelligence gaming uh, linkedin social networking it's just everywhere and this is what i like about this theory of slow compounders right you don't want companies that get filthy rich overnight because usually it means that they're easy to copy because anyone else can do it as well but the slow compounders that take like 10 15 years to build with with focus like like such an adela has been doing and adding the portfolio that's been just really story and i wonder how long it will take to dismantle such a company i think such a company if it gets bad management it can easily take 10 years before you really notice it just before things slow down this this wheels on fire there it's unbelievable what microsoft is doing yeah yeah look we we know you're a big fan um but yeah, yes they've been <laughs> they've been incredible there's no there's no denying even this year alone just from share price they, they've yeah they've really they've really taken off so um, it's hard to it's hard to fault them. And then, lastly, uh, recent news I think was the Jeppy equivalent was being launched worldwide, which I think is pretty big news for, especially for Europeans. I think. Yeah, because usually we get nothing like this, right? So maybe for listeners that are not aware of Yeppy, Yeppy is um, such a monthly income ETF which generates income by call option selling um it's not something I, I i like to have because the the performance and total return is is not so good but if you're let's say in retirement and you want to want to increase your dividend income then this might be a really good one or if you just want to enjoy current income as well but it's not really giving dividend growth right i think that's really important as a note here but what it, what it mainly shows is that gp morgan is now also thinking about europe yeah, when they think about launching a UCITS version. So everyone is, of course, now very, very interested in, I was it, in what Schwab will do, whether we will get the European version of SCHD. Yeah, I think that's what many people would look forward to because that's one of the 
few, maybe only ETFs in the world that gives, let's say, a 3% yield plus um, an almost double digit dividend growth, like, like, let's say, in the high single digit, low double digit. I think it's the only ETF in the world because if you go for the dividend aristocrats ETFs, you get like 1.5% or something like that. So this is really the one that combines current yield with, with growth. And, and I think that's why many people are so eager to get this one in Europe as well. Yeah, it could be a game changer for, for Europeans in terms of how we manage our portfolios, our allocation strategy. It could it could shake yeah. things up. I, I think that would be the one, even myself, uh, uh, look, ETFs in Ireland are, are tough with our with our archaic rules, but it, it would still be hard to ignore if we had an equivalent of, of that type of ETF. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But so yeah, it was it was a crazy year from that point of view, right? Yeah, it was. It was, but but also from a dividend perspective. I mean, with dividend investors, we've had we've had some crazy news in terms of dividend cuts and dividend hikes. Um, what's let's let's go with hikes first. Which one has been uh, your standout this year? Yeah, for me, it was uh, a company like Walter Skluer with 15 percent yeah um i think i i don't own it still yet um but this company is just a, a, a clear compounder but then also shell um i don't i don't remember the exact hike anymore but shell had also a multi-digit um uh, yeah dividend hike here and if you see how it's been recovering from the dividend cut that they did in 2020 during COVID it's really focused on shareholder return and the buybacks as well i think just with shell over the last year we had 12 percent or 13 percent in return from buybacks and dividend uh, yield which is just crazy right for for an oil company while well, oil is that as well <laughs> so for, for me this shows like how much money is uh, coming in there and if you're able to buy back eight percent of your your share capital it means that you have got a really high fr free cash flow yield and a really low multiple and, and this is what's so nice about what the company has been doing uh, here so yeah uh, th those two definitely stood out but then also the other boring companies like aflac an insurance company 19 percent on top of it so yeah aflac sticks in my mind because of tiago diaz um tiago's ah, been on yeah. on our show you know he he has his own sub stack and he he wrote quite a bit i think i think the article was like Four, four different articles in in one it was it was that in depth um about aflac but he was constantly saying they were undervalued i think they took off in share price at the time um i don't know if they doubled but they, they definitely went up 25 percent and, and and then they gave a 19 percent dividend hike so i was really pleased um for tiago when, when that came but then remember l'oreal 25 percent dividend hike as well i thought that blew my mind yeah and i read an article yesterday by the way the first a uh, person that inherited money from their parents crossed the 100 billion mark and that's the daughter of uh, the the founder of l'oreal she's still having a board uh, seat there quite quite influential but imagine that getting from your your parents some some shares inherited they are now worth 100 billion can you imagine i need to chat to my parents <laughs> <laughs> well they first need to start produce lipstick then i do, do irish women use lipstick of course they do yeah of course they okay do. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and then we've had some dividend cuts um oh. we've had quite a few actually more more than <laughs> i thought um but look vfc i think was was always in was always in the making but someone like yeah. tool the tool group i was not expecting yeah. that at all and I, I i don't think many europeans were well, but they don't they are not a regular dividend payer as such right uh, they've proven that over the history that their dividend is volatile uh, when they're doing well they pay a lot and when it's not so going so well they adjust because they're really focused on the payout ratio but uh, i i said i think it is mainly a surprise to people because many people love the brand i mean if you go camping or something like that or in the summer and you go to a sport area you see it everywhere yeah so you think it's doing well but it had many inventory problems, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, yeah. And, and then the other one that we saw coming kind of was Intel. Um, yeah. yeah. Was not something we got happy about, but we knew it was a turnaround play, not a dividend growth play. They've cut the dividend. And, you know, if you now look at the share price, I'm in the plus on Intel, which is crazy also, because it was, what was it, trading $25 at a certain moment this year, now $50. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 crazy. But uh, look, I think they had to they had to cut the dividend as well. They they did have they to had to protect uh, their their business. Yeah, they were, they were starting to struggle a little bit. But then yeah. we had some German German businesses that struggled this year. Yeah. Um, you look at Adidas, um, Venovia, and then I think we all said it. Vecinius as well cut their dividend. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it. I think Vecinius for me was the one I, I sold early in the year. Um, yeah. they were just too hard to understand, and it. it doesn't seem to be getting any easier if i'm honest yeah but this is also an awkward run right because they have given up their dividend to be able to get money was it 350 million uh, to keep their hospitals warm so effectively <laughs> to pay the gas bill yeah and i i still wonder if they did this voluntary or whether they were with the back against the wall by the government i, I still doubt here yeah. because, because they also want to just resume the dividend next year like if a cut never happens i wouldn't be surprised even if they they screwed screw the government back by uh i was hit uh, paying a special dividend or something like that next year yeah we'll see we'll see yeah. um but maybe we'll take some time to reflect on on the last year i mean we've yeah. we're at 177 shows now it's quite quite amazing when you think about it from where where we started but if you think over the last year we've had a number of guests on a number of big guests as well um who's been your favorite um well for me it's always uh ian lookbook i mean when i'm talking with him he just keeps on talking uh <laughs> yeah and but but everything or many things he says are you know he's a few years ahead of me when it comes to dividend investing so and he's so inspirational he, he's pure he is american so you really hear this californian in him like like everything is great but that's just cultural difference for me because I've been working with Californians, they're all like that uh, here. But if you see what he's doing, he, he created also a video the other day with his wife again, where they're talking about dividend investing, and it's really cute. And, and this guy just, uh, yeah, I just have a lot of goodwill towards him. Uh, I yeah, must say, super. He gives us a lot of time. Really nice guy. Um, as you said, we I think twice recorded. I think we've yeah. had to cut both of them short. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we just talk for for hours and hours. So super, super guy. Um, and I'd like to open this up to the group. Actually, who's been your favorite guest? Or what's your favorite episode? Feel free to raise your hands or, or write in the chat here. But for me, Brad Thomas, um, and purely because we had Ian on before, so I, I knew what to expect. But look, Brad yeah. came on. Brad is quite a big figure on Seeking Alpha. Writes. I don't know like we asked him how did he write so many so many articles he just churns them out but i think it was very insightful what he what he spoke to us about the real estate investment trust so he, he was trying to plug his own his book uh that's coming out i think reads for dummies um yeah. and and we have no problem with that but i think some of the insights he gave us it was just something different um and i really enjoyed having him on having him on the show it was it was something different i think from from our end yeah, definitely. And then we had also, um, I said, uh, two people that couldn't join, right? Uh, Sven Carlin, he doesn't want to join uh, yet. We're He's too small. All the time. We're too small. We're too small for him. So, um, you know, maybe keep on spamming him in the YouTube comments if you want him <laughs> on. And then the second one is uh, Jusse, uh, the the guy from uh, that also talks about real estate investment trusts all the time. Yeah. Um, he he wanted to come on before December, but he's just too busy with his business and such. So he, he postponed kind of a second time. So I, I still hope we can get him in 2024 somewhere on the podcast because he is like a European guy. And I, I would love to hear a European uh, uh, sound here yeah, uh, to Real Estate Investment Trust and give a bit of a balance towards Brett Thomas as well um yeah yeah so we had like uh, seven guests on this um this year i think we can do more so hopefully we can do like 10 12 uh, in the upcoming year um so also here if you have any names for us let us know we'll follow up uh, quite quickly on those yeah yeah and then if you look at the episodes of didn't talk guess which one was the the, the most listened to i don't know no, it was the the business breakdown about realty income. Ah. Uh, it, it scored really the best. So we started doing some business breakdowns this year on some typical dividend stocks, and they generally do really well. So it seems to be of an interest uh, to listeners, specifically if there is news around that stock at that time. Um, but then also the um, uh, how is it a simple topic like why dividend growth investment is the best strategy? I think this generate this probably i said interest a lot of new listeners that that try yeah. it out for the for the first time 
but for us this is, these are the topics that we were short in time during the week yes. and then we think like okay let's take an easy topic this week that doesn't require hours of preparation i i, I remember that when we were both exhausted we came online we're like oh what can we talk about and we did that in like five minutes and and yeah. to see that number too is it's it's quite funny but the real thing come on i'm not i'm not surprised i think at the time they were in the news as well um and it was it was quite popular and, and i like doing those business breakdowns because sometimes we ignore them um yeah. even for companies like real income or johnson johnson we say they're quality companies and they're this but sometimes you forget to look under the hood sometimes and, and yeah you can un uncover stuff so it's um yeah we should probably do more more business breakdowns i don't know if we do enough of them yeah no, it's true true so that let's let's continue that one um as well and then uh how is it yeah the other two are just uh guest shows so we had uh navigating the world with real in real invest no, real estate investment trust with brad thomas did well of course and a conversation about dividend growth investor with um how is it uh, tokan bob Lai also did really really well the guy from canada yeah so bob those were our top five uh, bob, effectively bob was interesting he was our was the first or second Canadian we've we've had a couple on. Yeah, and um, Bob was, was was quite an interesting character actually. Um, yeah, if you follow him on Twitter, um, he shows also his uh, dividend income. I think he's on forty five k at the moment, and <laughs> he, he can imagine that you have forty five k to reinvest back in the stock market. That's already half a hundred thousand almost. Yeah, and those generate dividends as well, plus yeah. your own contribution from salary, plus your portfolio growth. This guy's probably uh, netting 100k per year just in portfolio uh, uh, growth. Yeah, and, and he still wasn't near financial independence, if I remember correctly. So yeah, 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 yeah. He, yeah. he needs to move to a lower income place. Because... <laughs> he would live like a god in Poland here, I can yeah, tell you. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, but do you remember way back, I think it was our second episode in January 2023, we spoke about our all weather portfolio. <laughs> remember that <laughs> yeah yeah we had we had lots of different weather right uh, yeah, the, the rivers are overflowing at the moment in germany so yeah but we picked we picked five companies um and i don't know yeah. if you change from any of them right now we picked microsoft wd40 um rush holdings diageo and ahol delhaze we picked the five of those um and i just went back to see how they performed over the, since we did that show um, Microsoft blew it out of the power, obviously. Um, they were $220 at the time, and they were 376 when I checked this yesterday or the day before. Um, I mean, that's that's unreal. If we had to just listen to ourselves in January, we'd be sitting quite pretty on that. Um, but WD-40 surprised me. That was 163, and it's now 239, um, which is which is quite something when you think about what WD-40 is. It's a, it's a oil in a can that you spray <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly oh well, you need a lot of oil with this weather because it becomes rusty everywhere so yeah but uh, but then the other three rush diageo and ahold have i wouldn't say ahold struggled ahold probably stayed on a on a level plane but rush and diageo have certainly seen some better days i think yeah. diageo over the last month um saw 11 percent drop um, and yeah. so look i've been doing my best over christmas guys if you're the Azure shareholder i'm trying to get them back for you but it, i thought it was quite interesting to see wd40 perform so well um over the last year particularly when yeah. it was such a bumpy year if i remember correctly you were the one that chose russian diago diago right at the time yeah, yeah of course yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey i mean it for i mean it for the long term <laughs> yes exactly yeah ah good one i mean uh 13 is not too bad i think the stock market at 20 plus or something like that um yeah. you know it was yesterday also someone on twitter said like ah, i don't know if i want to share my performance because people are looking at s p 500 index as a benchmark but remember this is where the magnificent seven is in there right if you take them out the the performance wasn't that that good uh from s p 500 and which dividend growth investor owns all those seven at the same time um uh, with a similar kind of allocation of 40 or 50 percent of your portfolio yeah those are not a lot of people yeah, yeah. so it shows also how volatile the s p 500 is or how correlated it is to just those seven stocks yeah if if, if, if those seven stocks start to underperform it takes the whole s p 500 uh, index down yeah uh, we might oh, yeah. just quickly brush over then our portfolio performance and then get on to some questions from from these guys i'm actually quite excited to, to hear from some of the guys here so but do you want to talk through your last quarter how how did your portfolio do 
Um, well, actually, relatively well. I mean, it's just chugging along, right? So if I look at my the most important one, there's the projected annual dividend income that grew by five point well five percent let's say um which is which is really nice i mean five percent every quarter will be twenty percent per year or something like that so i'll take that any time so i'm i'm getting again much more um dividends also my portfolio value as such um uh, grew by around five percent so uh, and i mean i don't know if you observe the same but i've been all year i've been on on a, on a similar amount of money adding cash to it and it just got eaten up by by the stock market i didn't see i mean i threw money in it and i didn't see a change right because the next day the stock market uh, that my portfolio will go down with the same volume but then in the last few weeks it, it suddenly you get this hockey stick in the end right where it really pushed up and um, uh, yeah. that was quite comforting to see like okay you know the power of dollar cost averaging i got all those shares cheaper but you need to sometimes have this validation then when the stock market bounces back up that you see like okay phew, this was uh well done um but look hey i initiated a new position in evolution um uh, gaming yeah it's uh, also um um one that i'm quite proud on that i bought it because usually i i kind of shy away from high growth stocks uh, but with this one it was too obvious for me and i never had a discussion with my wife about gambling and investing in gambling <laughs> so uh, and it has no gambling in the name it is a gaming company so i hope she's not listening but uh, this one fits nice then in the portfolio um but also still adding to agree agree realty corporation um uh, realty income also i bought some hpq some texas instruments you inspired me with the newsletter to initiate uh, my position in my first CEF, I believe it's called, uh, Green Coat UK Wind. So I bought some of that. And I rounded up a position in Bristol Myers uh, as well not too long ago. So, you know, boring companies, I would say, um, but giving me good dividends. And I also sold something because, you know, I have this really s small part of my portfolio where I, I invest in non-dividend stocks. And what I typically do there is when the company doubles, I sell the half and then keep the rest. So that I'm uh, like like how Jim Cramer used to say it, like play with the house's money. Yeah. So I, I sold half a position in Meta, uh, Facebook formerly. So I doubled that. I think it took me three years or something, like four years so um it's like i don't know i i have once that like a total return i think it was 15 or 16 percent annually uh, based on that but yeah i now keep the other half and uh, i will just keep it in my portfolio until i think like it's not not worth having it anymore um so th that was more like my portfolio changes uh, my dividend income dropped in october by 40 percent that was because one big dividend payer moved it to november but November, I grew 14% and in December, 39%. But overall, over the whole quarter, my dividend income, my net, right, after tax grew by 16%. So um, I'm quite happy with that as well. I mean, I don't get such salary increases. I also know that it's part of um, uh, new cash contributed to the portfolio, of course. But it's nice to see my income grow, grow here. And, and these are really becoming larger values now that I really think like, wow, this is uh, it's, it's somehow getting close now. I'm now closer to the finish line than to the start. That's really nice to see. And every few percent growth now uh, also means much more than in the beginning. So it, it's, it's really nice to see this big money. And 2024, by September, I will be investing 10 years, right? So yeah. also for people uh, that are watching live here, like it's really working. After 10 years, I can really, really see the income coming in and the snowball. And if I look at, for instance, the contribution from dividends alone, uh, from all the money that I invested, 14% was this, this month from uh, dividend income, or this quarter from dividend income so and this money is generating new money again right and 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 that's that's for me really the beauty of of this kind of dividend growth um uh investing yeah like i, I can obviously see the see the chart and i can see that snowball on on, on your chart quite quite effectively and that five percent in in one quarter really blew me away and um, that's that's quite a jump um as you said if you do that every quarter over the course of a year that's 20 percent and like yeah one or two years and and you've reached your goal there 
No, 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 no. I still need four, four or five years. It depends also on the level of fire that I want to have. Do I want to have a barista fire uh, where it is like on the edge or do I want to have more fat fire? I don't know yet. Um, I'm that I, I continue measuring against my expense level, but I don't know yet like how much luxury I want to have. Yeah. or whether i i just do some side hustling if needed like uber driving or or you know i always had this dream to just do all kinds of jobs like like work a work a month in a kitchen at a restaurant just to learn how it is <laughs> right how does the kitchen work uh, uh, i don't mind to, doing the dishes go yeah. back to me when you do that please <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but why not i think this is so cool to do this be a uh teach a month at a school about finance uh, i mean the freedom you have and and the curiosity you can feed with this is 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 what what inspires me probably the most yeah yeah but listen you, you saw you sold half a meta what are you going to do with that cash is that going to go into another uh, it's been reinvested in one of those companies that i bought ah, yeah okay. I, I i don't okay. my, my i always my usually my my cash account is a little bit in the minus um and then with my salary i i top it up again um because i don't want the cash to just lay there it, it needs yeah. to work for me good good yeah overall overall a solid solid end to the year then i would say from from your perspective i'm, I'm very happy i don't know yet what uh how my annual report is right because the one thing that i can't measure easily and that takes me quite some calculations i will start on that like early next week is for instance organic dividend growth my goal is six percent i've not been able to achieve it yet yeah because i bought over time i bought also quite some high yielders like let's say omega healthcare i bought it then at an eight or nine percent yield but it's not growing the dividend yeah but i'm reinvesting those dividends all the time so um but what's important for me that at time of retirement i really would like to get this six percent in dividend growth annually yeah, yeah so i hope i think this year should be closer because of the massive hikes we have seen in our portfolio um yeah but let's see I, I i haven't done the math yet there yeah awesome how about uh, you yeah my mine's not not too bad i was more concentrated on what i bought this quarter it was pretty much vg properties uk wind um coca-cola and i bought some cme group which i don't think we speak an awful lot on on the show about them but i i definitely do something in depth on them because in terms of special dividends they these guys always produce um but yeah i, I kind of concentrated a lot on on vg i uh, bought some realty income in there as well um it's funny you mention agree realty because i'm writing about them for the next newsletter and um, there was no point in you doing it because you'd be too biased um <laughs> so I'm, I'm sitting back but it's it's quite actually interesting comparing them to realty income there's a lot of similarities but there's there's quite some differences as well so um that will be the next newsletter um which i'm quite excited about uh, but in terms of dividend income, I just looked back quickly over this time last year. I was averaging about 120 over those months um, each month. Um, this year, I'm above 200, some 219 euro average over that. So it's it's quite a jump over over 12 months. Um, remember, this year I didn't do any tricks. There's no options. There's no dividend capture. So it's all just pure dividend income. Um, my portfolio has actually evened out. My largest holding is still Bassett. But it was much larger. I think my largest holding was 14% of my portfolio this time last year. Now it's at six. So I'm getting everything close to around that five percent mark that that I want to have long term, which is which is quite interesting. But financial services, as I mentioned earlier, are still 32% of my portfolio. So I, I, I can't see myself buying too many of those in 2024. But as I said, you can't look at gift horse in the mouth. So if something pops up, I will definitely look to do that. But my paddy yeah i mean you you're talking about five percent jump my my overall is 15 percent i am so a five percent jump for me would be massive so that's why i, I kind of chuckled when when i saw what what you're doing but still 15 percent. i'm at this since 2018 i would say um so still a little bit be behind you but quite quite pleased with with, with how this is going L like you i haven't um i quickly threw this together um i'll, I'll do a proper in-depth research over the whole year next week i took next week off work so i can actually do stuff like this um and enjoy my christmas but but 15 percent is a lot of bills you can pay already yeah i mean it, it it is it is it is quite quite so actually i was i i set out my goal at the start of the year um of reaching just over four thousand after tax i reached that for tax so tax uh, if you include tax i was just underneath that over the whole year which is which is quite something you know it's 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 not a, it's not a small amount of money, I have to say.
No, but if you think about it, once you're at the twenty percent, you will uh, maybe, or you could consider working a day less per week. Yeah, that's another way of looking at it, right? You could, you don't need to be totally not working anymore. You can also just go to your boss and say, like, you know what? Let me work thirty-two hours. <laughs> yeah, well, I work about sixty, so I don't think that would work. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I have to I have to say I'm I'm quite happy. Um, what I'm quite interested to look back on is is over the course of the year, um, what I bought. I, I do have a list there, um, but I haven't analyzed because I remember at the start of the year I said I wanted to buy just quality, and I don't think I stuck to that. I have to say, um, it was a lot of high yielding this year. But I think with the opportunities that came up, particularly in insurance, but also you mentioned CEFs, um, inflation and and interest rates hammered those as well. Um, so there was opportunities there that I felt like that I that I had to take. So I didn't buy as many the Johnson and Johnsons and Texas Instruments as I would have liked, but I definitely have added some companies I'm I'm quite happy with as well. Well, that's it's really really nice, and I mean for me it's also nice to see how you have evolved with your investing because I've seen your portfolio fluctuating, how you were in the beginning probably a bit more high yield chasing yeah and and how this has changed into more quality which is also really uh, really good to say and you know i come on 15 percent you know in the beginning it feels like slow but this 15 percent will be 20 percent in no time because your your dividend hikes start to matter at a certain moment yeah, yeah. It, like i can start to see that now when i'm when i'm, I'm not quite investing like what I, what I invest in only 12 1500 a month i'm not quite reaching out in terms of dividend but it is starting to make an impact um if i look at where i was last year in terms of the paddy it was eight percent so it, it's jumped it's jumped quite a bit actually over, oh, that's over really a lot yeah. yeah and then uh, any any reflection uh, besides that the, have you seen anything that you feel like already like ah oh, shouldn't have done that um yeah i remember i bought wpc and then they cut their dividend so i sold them <laughs> i think i held them for about four days and a half for about four weeks um i bought them and then i, I didn't see that dividend cut coming i have to say um and obviously they they, they did a stealth dividend cut so I, I sold them i don't know if that was the right or wrong decision because i, I still think yeah. fundamentally in the business is good um but i bought them my thesis was based on their dividend and not cutting the dividend and and they they Proved me wrong in, in quite a short amount of time, so so I sold them. So that's probably the only one. That, the rest of the, the ones I, I did make some sales this year. Um, there was some low hanging fruit that was left over from my option trading. So CCL was one of them. I got rid of them. Um, I sold Intel, uh, VFC for seniors, um, and then there was some other CFs that are US best US based that I had to sell because I'm not allowed to hold them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm quite I'm quite happy with the ones I've sold. As you said, there's a lot of high yielders, a lot of deadwood um out of that portfolio so i think my portfolio is, is stronger than it was this time last year so i'm happy about that so, so do you feel that you are crushing your dividend investment goals for 2023 yeah i think so i think so i think reaching close to four thousand a year was was quite a big goal so that's i'm quite i'm quite happy with that nice nice because that's a little bridge to the podcast poll and question we had last uh last two shows so on in the last show we asked like what uh or the show before we asked like are you crushing your dividend investing goal and about 70 percent of the people said yes but also 30 percent said no so i'm also very curious to hear like if it's not happening why it's happening because again sometimes the social media i sense that people get this feeling because they benchmark against s p 500 yeah but then yeah. you really should bench your, benchmark your portfolio against high tech growth uh, stocks so i don't know if that's uh, fair but uh, very interesting but also we had um, uh, how is it we asked last uh, podcast show like what's been your biggest insight this year and we had uh, joram um, answering he said like just de defining your strategy in advance why are you buying and when will you sell and stick to it and then that re resonates a lot with me because that was also one of the learnings i had to do so for every stock that I purchase, I put always my one buy, my, my reason, my investment thesis there in a one liner. And often I just look back at it when I'm doubting and thinking, okay, is this still the case? And I feel always I need to be able to articulate it in a one liner. Otherwise, it's probably already too complicated uh, uh, for me. And then Tofu, I mean, <laughs> what a name, but uh, uh, he mentioned that the dividend hikes are higher percentage wise than his salary increase, which that's also a very very nice 
pot. I always uh, have the same here. Like, I, I I I can go to my boss, but I mean, it's it's better to be a shareholder than to an employee, uh, yeah. generally speaking. Imagine imagine working for L'Oreal and asking for a twenty five percent increase in your wages. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they would say no. <laughs> Yeah, and then your neighbor who's just invest, investing in your company is coming like, oh, you did well, guy. Yeah, tap on the shoulder. <laughs> Thank you for the twenty-five percent salary hike. <laughs> yeah. Um, so look, I, I I think I think in the next the next episode, uh, be early January, we, we might do our goals for the year. Um, so I think that would be a nice question we'll we'll put in this this podcast is what are your investment goals for twenty twenty four? So we'll we'll put that in the podcast as always and. We look forward to hearing hearing some answers answers on that. Okay, I think it's time for our listeners' questions, um, which is quite good. Um, we've got we've got lots of people here, um, and hopefully, you will uh, come on and, and ask us some questions, and we'll do our best to to answer them for you. Well, we have one here. I'm, I'm Kieran. You you ask us a nice question. Would you like to ask it live? Yes. Hello. Um... So my question falls in quite nice to what you're speaking of before. And do you have a list of people you'd want to get involved with the podcast? So my personal would love to see him on there would be from Fast Graphs. He just basically sure. breaks it all down. And I think it rules out all the rubbish quite quick. So you can analyze whether something's actually good or not. Yeah, so I, I actually reached out to uh, Chuck one time, but he didn't respond. So I don't know where I can reach him that he actually answers a question. I think he's on Twitter just having an automatic feed. So I DM'd him. No response. I can see that he didn't even read the message. So I don't know how we can reach him. Um, yeah, ex exactly. So I will I will, I will, will do one more time. Maybe I'll try to email Fastcrafts themselves and, and, and see if someone responds there and so we can get him on the show because... To your point, I think he would fit really well here. He has also a strong interest in dividend investing, so be an awesome guest on the show. And you know, he's like the nestor of of, of the community, I would say. Yeah. I mean, it's even nice to see not a kid who is like just twenty years old. No, no, no offense, but um, uh, like someone who is like probably in his sixties uh, somewhere, teaching all of us about investing, about value investing. For me, that's very inspirational yeah. that you're never too old to jump on social media, which is definitely, when, when he grew up, they were probably still looking at the pink sheets and everything. Yeah. And now he's mastering YouTube and, and building a large following online and having a having a web-based business, which is very inspiring to me. Yeah. And, and and there's no there's no BS with him. He just gets straight to the point. You, you watch yeah. one of these videos, you know exactly what you're going to get and what you're going to learn from it. And I think, I, look, I personally would love to have Chuck on as well. Um, in terms of other guests, I mean, look, we've, we've mentioned some of them in terms of, of Sven and and the, uh, I can't remember, the European real estate guy on Seeking Alpha as well. Yes, but yeah. there, is, there is quite a few that, that we would like. We've reached out to loads. We, we don't always get a response, but like, we'll put this poll up again. If, if anyone has recommendations or anyone that would like to come on the show, we, we take... We take anyone that's interested in dividend growth investing. We like hearing about other people's journeys, but also we like to have experience on here as well and, and try and learn from them. So we will definitely take yeah. recommendations from, from all you guys. I would personally like to have a CEO on. We had the CEO from Difama on once, and I think we, we could do more CEOs and really ask them questions, uh, proper questions about the investment uh, pieces here. So... Um, we probably should really start reaching out to some investor relations uh, websites and really ask if, if one of the CEOs wants to come on. For instance, why not the one from Texas Instruments? Yeah, they are so focused on cash flow and dividend return. We should get this guy on one time if possible. Yeah. What about Pat Gelsinger? We can see how laser focused he is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, why not? I'll take Pat Gelsinger. <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, anyone else? Um, I see Simon. You also have a question uh, for us. Yeah. Hey guys. Um, so my question is regards to being in sort of the boring middle part of the investing journey, mm -hmm. and as your dividend income increases, I, I personally feel tempted sometimes to relax my sort of risk tolerance and yeah. uh, open small small positions in. Um, uh, invest in different stocks that I normally wouldn't do. Um, 
or maybe even non non dividend uh, stocks. Um, but do you sometimes feel have the same the same temptation to do that uh, as you reach your kind of financial? Yes, market? definitely, definitely. And I mean, I've got many temptations. Sometimes I feel like, you know, that's that's the issue. I like my job. If I wouldn't like my job, it would have been much easier. But sometimes I feel like, oh, you know what? I could just quit my job. I just need to find some money somewhere each month. Yeah. But I don't need to anymore have, let's say, a high middle class income uh, job. I don't need to have the stress anymore that comes with the with the pressure to always need to perform uh, and such. So that's one of the temptations I have. With the investing in other stuff, I don't have it so much in growth stocks. I have this small percentage in my portfolio because I had it already from the beginning to, to nurture my value investing uh, mindset. I also have a lot of joy in missing out. Actually, it becomes sometimes even a sport, uh, like like the, more like eating popcorn. When I see everyone jumping on it, I think like I'll see you in a year. Yeah, and uh, and and but what I also have is like what is tempting for me is more like. Um, with the dividend growth compass yeah i would love to to just maybe that will be a reason for me even to think like okay maybe i should just quit my job and just go 40 hours a week in this uh, and such and um so these kinds of things are more tempting or for instance um investing in real businesses that's also something that i was actually thinking this morning about like you know i see sometimes these businesses here and i think like well with a little bit of capital or extra marketing they should be able to do much well maybe i could buy uh, much better maybe i can buy a small ownership stake into it and build like a portfolio of local businesses here uh, that's really tempting for me uh, to be fair well yeah yeah it's it's, uh, it's, but, um, yeah. it's 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 quite funny how the brain works doesn't it because like you, you've had you've had a strategy that you're sticking to for for quite some time I'd, I'd imagine and you're getting closer to financial independence and then all of a sudden you want to change what what works through discipline um and and try and maybe reach that quicker or do something that that you wouldn't normally do um in order to try and achieve that when actually what you're doing actually works but i think it's just the human brain i look i'm i'm quite the same i've done a, i've done a lot of, we talked about option trading with different different types of strategies to try and pick something but uh, for me, I I get it, but I would I would like to hope that I can try and stay disciplined because that that works. I would I would I would not like to deviate away from what I have. If I have extra cash, that's separate. I have no problem trying to invest in something else. But I, I'm going to try. I'm not saying I will because <laughs> because I, I'm I'm quite um, spontaneous sometimes. But yeah, I would I would like to think that I would be able to to stick to, to stick to the strategy because greed, I've learned for me, has not worked in my favor. It's always worked against me. Um, but yeah, I can I can definitely understand it. But but something investing in in tangible real estate would be something I would I would love to do, and if I could afford it or, or something like that. But outside of that, I think I'll stick to dividends, boys and girls. I think I'll, I'll stick to that. Yeah, and if you want to fight the boredom, you can always start a blog, uh, a podcast, a newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> have kids, have a dog, have a cat, and uh, you have no time anymore to think others than making sure you don't forget about investing in your dividend portfolio <laughs> this month. I'll, I'll consider that. As yeah, I can tell you, I've, I would advise actually everyone just blogging and maybe not so even so much for, um, you know, getting famous or something about that. But for me, it was so it, it really improved my strategy when I started writing down what I was actually doing and what my learnings were. It helped me to to be more consistent as well and i think blogging for that is really nice because you have people commenting and you have people also giving you feedback uh most often it, it's nice but sometimes they're also challenging you and then you have an option either you try to understand what they say or you ignore them i usually try to understand and and this has helped me so often by just improving my strategy even even the little things sometimes or just already the awareness helps me to prevent stepping into a pitfall or something like that so I can definitely yeah. recommend it. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Casper, I think you have a question. So, actually, uh, yeah. So, um, hey guys. Um, so, the question I have is actually it was linked to to what Simon mentioned. It, I was wondering if you are hundred uh, percent, if your financial independence strategy is focused a hundred percent on dividend uh, portfolio, or do you? um explore as well other type of investments so direct you were mentioning for example property 
um, like, are you are you are you also considering other type of uh, investments as part of the journey for maybe diver diversification? Yeah, property will definitely be one that I will get into it eventually, and and there's two reasons for that. Um, uh, but one of the main reasons is is something that my wife is also interested in, and something that she could help and manage. And it's it's I think it's far easier for my wife to understand how property works because it, in Ireland there's there's a lot of property developers and it's it's quite popular over here. So there's lots of lots of people to help you and guide you and, and it's something that she can own and manage and actually she should be quite good at physically managing it and dealing with people. I think when it comes to stocks and investments and ETFs, um, she's trying, she's learning, but she struggles a little bit more because she, she can't hold them or see them or, or do anything with them. It's just names on a paper. So I think real estate will definitely be something that we will target eventually. But I think dividend growth will be our main path until until I've reached a position where I don't need to work anymore and then we'll target property because I don't know if, if you had it, but we had the great financial crash in Ireland, um, which was property related and lots of people leveraged up way, way too fast. Um, so it's, it's not something that I'm, I'm keen to do, but if I can, if I can have my income from my job and have the same income from my dividend, then I'll be more comfortable transitioning into real estate and then my wife can be a little bit more hands on. Yeah, for me, it will probably stick just to dividend income um, because all all the other things that I consider, like I've not done a lot on YouTube this year, but if I wanted to do something like like, like that as well, like I, I will not do nothing at a certain moment. So I will always be busy. So what I could consider is like, you know what, if I'm at 80%, maybe I do quit my job. If, if maybe my job, I don't like it anymore. I think like, okay, I just do blogging and YouTube and, and take the other 20% from online income, but I would still consider that work um, or let's say active income, let's call it like that. Um, uh, but pure passive income, it will stick to dividend income. Um, I think I mentioned last week, I wouldn't mind having real estate, but there's just nothing invest worthy here for me that, that gives me a positive cash flow. If I would invest in the market here, it would be mainly for capital appreciation and and that's not what i prefer i i i always want something cash flow positive uh, from that point of view and, and what about you casper do you stick to dividend growth or do you have other investments that that you do yeah that that's why i was wondering actually because i i started investing in the for dividends in uh, 2018 so about five years ago but then when i so it's at the moment it's like 100 percent of my um new money that i put in every month goes into dividend but in the past i was investing in other things like peer-to-peer -peer lending uh you know in europe there was these platforms for uh, crowdfunding and so on and uh, so when i make the like the the balance at the end of the year i actually realized that even though at the moment my strategy is 100 percent on dividend growth um it's probably not even half my entire um investment uh, part of the financial independence strategy so um yeah um but yeah i was um, mainly in the past in peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending with uh, your, some european platforms yeah and, and how did you how did you find them the peer -to -peer? um through online forums basically oh you mean that like uh, yeah i mean do, do you think they're, they're good or what sort of experience in them sorry yeah well i think um it was very interesting at the beginning because I, I think I was early. So it was in 2014 when I started with those. Um, but there were a lot of risks. I know that a few of them went under. Um, so, yeah, I think it was interesting in the past because you could get, uh, you could loan to, to businesses, European businesses, uh, and get probably 12% uh, interest rate yeah. on your loans but over time you could see some of them were defaulting um, some of the platforms uh, went into bankruptcy or some of them were entire scams as well so you really had to manage a lot your um, your risk and diversification and let's say it was it was not like a sleep well, sleep well at night yeah. strategy yeah um and at the moment with uh, you know because of the the interest rates um uh, increase uh, of everywhere, uh, I think like 12% for the risk is not really a good return um, anymore. 
Um, so yes, yeah. But yeah, uh, I, I think it, yeah, on, on depending on the market cycle, the, the economic cycle, it, it was probably a good strategy in 2015. But you personally, I started exiting uh, just when COVID hit, um, yeah. and uh, I, I don't I don't know right now if it's a good idea or not. Yeah, because I, I had similar. So back back in 2017, yeah, maybe just before dividend investing, I I was also doing peer to peer, and I believe the name was Property Partners in the UK. So it was UK property, um, and also started exiting it then around COVID. Um, obviously Brexit hit it hard, and then COVID as well, and you could start to see lots of defaults, and, and that's why I asked. I knew there was a lot of a lot of risk around that, but um, there is one in Ireland that's actually quite decent property bridges it allows you to give give money to investors in property and they build that property and, and they give you return it's it's actually um not as risky as the peer-to-peer -peer lending you're actually giving it to an investor obviously there's still risks um associated with that but it's 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 slightly slightly different model but it's um they're always quite interesting you, you get high returns from them but as you said the risk always always outweighs it so I think that's why I prefer dividend growth investing. I think the risk is less. Um, it helps me sleep well at night. I mean, you could make money quicker and probably easier than dividend growth investing, but can you take the risk? And, and what I found is I can't. I think I can until my money's on the line and, and you start to see it drop and, and I actually can't take that risk. So nice, nice one. Um, as the next question, I think we have also a question from you, Igor. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the all the inspiration. And I recently started uh, uh, studying about the subject and and investing myself. So thank you for inspiration and free inf information. Uh, my question is about. Uh, I don't quite understand why ETF is not a good deal for us Europeans, and also uh, why the a strategy that you, you early on focus more on growth or uh, using ETFs or growth stocks, just like you did with Meta, and then sell it and put on a dividend uh, yeah. uh, portfolio. Isn't that like quicker? I don't, I don't, I don't really yet understand the taxes and all, all this other yeah. information. This, that I, yeah, I, I get this thinking as well, because I had this thinking a lot, Igor, because the first one in ETF is like, you know, why worry about stock picking if you anyway cannot beat the market? Why don't you just take an ETF? That was always my thinking, right? And then the second yeah. one is like, yeah, you know, if I take growth stocks and they go up a lot, then I just sell it and reinvest it for income. Yeah. So yeah. first of all, I pay 19% capital gains tax. So for instance, for me now to sell Microsoft uh, after it uh, went six, seven times up, then pay 90% over that profit is a lot of um, um, a lot of money that I would need to need to pay. Yeah. Uh, but still, you could argue like if it grew five times compared to one that uh, grew one time, it's still like worth paying for um, here. But then again, how? I mean, if you look at the best investors in the world, yeah, like like that did it for ten years in a row. Then even I, I put a tweet this week about this this guy from england he did 15 percent um was it um uh smith uh, terry smith and then you had uh, some of the biggest super investors like warren buffett maybe he was able to do 20 25 percent over over a decade with little little money so while this is a big delta compared to um uh, to what i'm doing i mean these are let's say a few people out of a population of a billion people yeah i don't see myself as having this edge if you read about warren buffett in his early days when he was investing he knew about geico because he was going to the ceo talking with the ceo learning about the business we we, we don't have the same i mean what we what we base our information on is annual reports yeah it's not like and and, and sometimes from products that we own but i'm not walking into a manufacturing plant of a small cap or something like that and i see suddenly how much production they have and know like whoa wait i need to step into this now because the next quarter we will see a lot of sales because everyone is saying like oh we're overtime working because we got suddenly all this demand. I don't have that knowledge, right? And often those super investors have this edge. Now, when it comes to ETFs, it's really simple. I would love to have a core in ETFs. I would love to have maybe 20, 25% of my portfolio in ETFs. But 
if someone can show me an ETF that gives proper dividend growth with a decent yield at investment, I'm all for it. But if you, there's a blog article uh, that I have uh, about 15 uh, UCITS ETFs on my blog, if you look at all the statistics, it, it, it's it's kind of few bar. If you have a bit of more high yield, then the dividend is flat. It's volatile. I don't want my dividend to be cut. So it's rather um, that I don't see these equivalents. And I know that on Reddit, if you go there, people talk a lot about the All World Index and everything. But this also comes a lot, for instance, from the Dutch community because they pay a wealth tax. If you pay a wealth tax, your investment uh, um, strategy might become totally different because then you can just say like, oh, you know, I don't pay capital gains tax. I let just my ETFs and everything compound. And then at the time I want to live from income, I switch it, I sell it. There are no costs related to it. And you just invest it in a high income producing asset at the time. So for me, that's also not an option, uh, Igor. Because you're in Poland, right? Yes, yes. So I pay I pay capital gains tax here, nineteen percent, and and, and that the makes Germans, a big difference. Germans don't pay uh, taxes on on capital gains. I don't know about capital gains. I do know they pay a lot of dividend tax. <laughs> That's another story. Okay. In um, Ireland, we pay thirty three percent capital gains. So it's quite a uh, quite a big jump from from nineteen percent. So you can you can take what European DJI said and and compound it. It's 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 quite a it's quite a lot. And and not only that, we have this deemed disposal rule. Um, so every eight years, we have to pretend to sell the ETF even if we don't and pay gains on the the ga fictional gains that we made. Um, and if if we do sell if we do sell it at a loss, we we, we can claim that back. But every eight well. The first after the first eight years you have to calculate this and then every year after that you're, you're calculating it so it's um it's yeah, quite we, tricky we really i mean don't don't work for any in ireland like you sorry to, it, so it's really uh, not a, a good option in ireland like, I didn't yeah know. i mean it, it's 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 one of the reasons why why i don't like to do it so i mean it, it does cut a lot of your compounding out um, and then on top of that, you have a lot more paperwork that you have to keep track of. You have to keep track of every single time you buy something, and then and then pay tax eight years from that as well. So it's um, yeah, it's it's quite difficult. It's it's one of the reasons why I don't don't do ETFs. And and don't get me wrong, if if ETFs were a lot more accessible or the tax wasn't as bad, I probably never would have came into dividend growth investing. Um, but they kind of just shoehorn me in that way with with the way that the tax regime works. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, for the answer. I, I think Kieran also has a question or yeah. a comment around yeah. this. Just sort of following on from that, as in when you said you can put it all in a growth and then come back 15, 20 years later, sell it all and then instantly go for the dividend part. In that part, you'll never learn all the stuff you learned along 20 years. I think the big shock to the system of I'm now not getting these huge gains every year. It's just a little bit comes in, a little bit comes in. I think that probably spooks a lot of people as well. So being yeah. in there and having the experience, I think makes a huge part. I, I think it would be hard to transition back. If, if, if you've been successful in that, let's say you, you put something in and you make a lot of money in 10 years with growth, how are you going to trick your brain into saying, okay, I'm ready to go into dividend growth investing? Surely you'd probably say, ah, growth works, I'm going to stick with growth. And, and, and you stick with that method. I, I, I can't see a scenario where you go from something that is successful and makes a lot of money into something, as you said, that might be slower in, in getting that money. I, I mean, I could be wrong, but my experience, I don't think I could transition that easily. Yeah, what's also interesting is that I think most dividend growth investors have experience with growth investing, but kind of bad experience. For instance, we saw a lot of uh, people reaching out after after last year because last year's many portfolios got literally blown up. I mean, there were people with 50, 60 percent loss because they were growth investors. They bought all these kind of hype stocks that were uh, very popular at a certain moment in the stock market, and 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 they have some have yet to recover from this um, year. So, being a growth investor is not easy. You really need to pick the winners. Uh, you also need to let your winners ride. Um, you need to be able to deal with 50, 60% drawdowns in the stock market as well. So it's very, there's much more emotion, I think, to it um, uh, than many. But 
yeah if you're successful in this I, and, and that's probably i guess what everyone should do and what i always advise it's not so much about dividend growth investing but take a strategy that fits your character yeah uh, of course not when you're a gambler don't don't go gambling that's not investing but generally i mean probably i just have a lot of patience in my life and and i like i like gardening as an example maybe that's the reason why i'm a dividend growth investor i don't know but it fits my it fits my character um a lot i'm not the one on the race circuit with a uh, uh, in the weekend trying uh, to 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 set a record and knowing that i might risk crash my car but maybe such people prefer i don't know crypto investing more or something like that um so i think character wise it's really important to have the right strategy uh, that fits it um hosein i think you have a question and you, you may tell me how to pronounce your name i get grief off european dj the whole time here <laughs> no problem no problem at all um so yeah my question was that you guys are purely reading the financial education books or time to time you are switching on some novels some fictional books if you do are you feeling guilty that you are spending your time something which is not that you know effective so i was just curious what you guys reading in general besides the financial books uh this is a tricky one because you can spend time only once and when you go on vacation then you know uh, you know what helps you say after nine or ten years of reading I've, I've read almost every financial education book i could and the new ones are usually a repetition of that with a new new sauce over it so i'm not so interested anymore so i've been shifting more to autobiographies uh, of, of of successful people which i also really like yeah and, and, and i need sometimes uh, fiction because fiction is also what triggers the curiosity and it, uh, sometimes you also need a break from investing. So um, I'm reading now a, a, a book about uh, an old sporter, a Dutch sportsman. I'm, I'm writing a book, reading a bit about his life, and I really enjoy it. It has nothing to do with investing, and but it's still something I really enjoy. I was at a certain moment into Russian uh, novels. That was like four or five years ago um, because they have some really good classics. And yeah. I, I i like it but I, I i fully understand what you mean if you're packing like which books do you put in there and which book do you read first um it's easier now than it was in the beginning in the beginning uh, i had those butterflies and i was only i i was eating those financial education books not anymore yeah i'm, I'm quite I'm quite similar i have a I have a white spread um I never feel guilty when I'm not reading because once once you're reading, you're spending time to yourself. Sometimes you need a you need a break. You need to switch off. Um, I think between the podcast and the blogs and the newsletters, we spend quite a lot of time focusing on on dividend stocks. And sometimes it's nice to to shut off from that. And what I'm reading at the moment um, is the Tattooist of Outswitch. Um, I do kind of, kind of like the the war the world war books. Um, I find them quite interesting. So that's. That's what I'm reading. It's not quite fiction, um, and I don't know why that helps me shut off. But it's I find it quite, quite interesting that that whole era. So, yeah, I think it's good to to mix up books. And how about you? What what are you reading at the moment? Um, now I just actually finished this Outsider. I switch on the Psychology of Money. But now actually I want to have give a break and to read Witcher series. So that's why I want to feel a little bit relief after your comments. So I think I can read them comfortably after this comment. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> and, and even if you have a dividend portfolio, you shouldn't worry so much about your investments anyway. They, they probably <laughs> co continue compounding. So I would do no, after no. Witcher, then the Harry Potter, if you haven't read them or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, good option can be. I haven't. So thank you. Yeah. Another reason to, to consider dividend growth investing, right? You can read whatever <laughs> you want in your portfolio continue to go forward totally thank you good. thank you thank you guys we have also um, a, a question from Attila I believe he's also online yeah sure uh, yeah hi everyone um, yeah my question goes towards uh, gathering news uh, like a daily news um, and I wonder what sources are you using to stay up to date in terms of announcements dividends uh, and so on because actually it's what I realized that there are tons of news sources out there and it's very easy to get lost, especially if someone who starts, uh, start, yeah. started with investing, then just, yeah, just quit getting crazy. 
Um, so, you know, we have the luxury that we build a whole database now with uh, dividend hikes. So if you ask me about dividend updates and dividend news, that's where I get it from. I can just run a query. We, we publish the updates also every time in the newsletter. But before that, when it came to, I said, uh, let's say just general stock news, I've got the CNBC app on my phone and the CNBC app, I just have my uh, list of tickers in, in my portfolio and I've got a list of stocks that I'm interested in just to follow in, in the news. And that's where you can, uh, when you have your watch list and you scroll below your watch list, you see all the latest updates because they tag the tickers to it. Another one could be Seeking Alpha, gives a, si a similar service as well, um, where you can read this. When it comes to dividend hikes, that's a bit more uh, tricky if you go outside because you could say Seeking Alpha gives them. But when it comes to European stocks, you're usually uh, uh, missing out on those. So for me, it is again, we have our own database where I keep track on those, but also social media helps me, our Facebook group, for instance. We have this habit when there is a, one of our European stocks is um, hiking their dividend. It's, it's uh, someone will say kaboom or something like that, and, and you will see the hike there. Um, but there are not really good trackers like that uh, publicly available when it comes to European uh, dividend growth stocks. Yeah. So that's uh, still an issue in the market, I would say. I find the hero quite good for for news, mm. um, and yeah. also if you're looking at dividend X dates and, and when it dividend yeah. I, I use that quite a bit. Um not so much on the app but on the on the website on the PC. It's quite good. Good, thank you. And then we have I believe a uh, last question from Dividend MVP who is here. Nick uh Utala, I believe. Hey guys, sorry I'm not on camera but I uh, just wanted to ask have you bought anything tangible with your dividend income? Because I always feel like, you know, I'm getting some money, but I'm I'm not buying anything. So, you know, just just want to know if you have bought something tangible. Um, yes, but it's usually left pocket, right pocket, uh, if you know what I mean. I can buy things from dividend income, but or I can say that I bought it from dividend income, but I probably still paid it from my bank account because i have to tell you a secret i've never transferred out money from the hero or interactive brokers so i'm living in the understanding that this is that this is possible but sometimes i'm making this joke like what if you invested i don't know a million in your broker and then you you figure out that you actually can't transfer money out so <laughs> i just so much hope that this will work one day um but what i often do um uh, I, I often just you know celebrate when i hit a milestone so i'm not public about the value of my portfolio uh, for for also security reasons as such i don't want any person knocking my door at a certain moment um here you hear this a lot in the crypto scene right where people were suddenly uh, even kidnapped uh, like like people that were on social media and such so i, I don't do such things but uh, when I hit a milestone, I often buy a bottle of champagne from the dividends, as an example, and celebrate with my wife on this. Um, uh, a holiday we did once where I felt like, okay, you know, uh, you know, this, this holiday has really been sponsored by dividend income. Um, it's more a mental trick, I must say, because like I told you, I, I never pulled the dividends out. But still, uh, there's a good point that you make like you should not postpone the reward only until you're retired i think sometimes you also need to enjoy the benefits it's giving you today already uh, because otherwise the boring middle is really boring uh in between that's that's nice. a good point i've ne i've never withdrawn money either from from both of my <laughs> does anyone know does it work <laughs> yeah i, I I guess not. <laughs> Have you done it, uh, MVP? Have you ever withdrawn money from your account? So I'm close to. I'm thinking, you know, my my birthday is coming up. So I was thinking to, you know, get those, you know, one of those electric bikes. Yeah. Where, yeah. You know, you can go and ride on, and I feel I would feel really good that I it is sponsored by my dividend income. So just a token of appreciation. So I'm close to that. Well, let us know if it works. Yeah, if you can get the money out from your account. <laughs> sure, I will do. Thank you. So I think this was it from everyone that suggested questions. Is there still anyone with a question or a comment? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Just one um, last question. On the um, 
um, you know, this the, the book, The Outsider, the, it's about these uh, exceptional CEOs with the amazing capital allocation studies. And one thing that attracted my attention that all the they have in common to find the dividends as the tax ineffective and what they were doing all the time to all either stock buybacks or the aggressive acquisition. So what do you think about this capital allocation strategy, which they found the dividends ineffective, tax ineffective? Generally speaking, I, I think theoretically it is tax inefficient. Yeah, buybacks are more tax efficient. But if you look then at the statistics of buybacks, you look at the graphs compared to dividend, you see that every time when there is a crisis, the there's maybe 20% or 30% left of the buybacks from what the companies were in, uh, initially doing. So there goes your return. And this is the interesting fact, right? If you're what it shows is that most companies are buying back dividends at their heights and not at their lows. At the lows, they are suddenly in capital preservation. So I think it can work really well if you invest in those companies with such a mentality. And for instance, Berkshire Hathaway is doing this. They are very clear and like, okay, if the stock price goes under this, we turn the buyback on, no matter where the cycle is. But most companies are not doing that. Most companies stop the buybacks and protect the dividends. So, you know, if you're looking at a uh, total return, then that becomes probably a bit of a different story. But for me, dividend growth is what I see. And it's more, more predictable, the dividend growth. And I always feel, and I, I don't have any facts besides it, but I always feel that in America, many people and former employees have stock in their portfolio let's say if you're an old uh, intel uh, employee now retired and you've got hundreds of thousands in stock you depend on the dividend income so i always have a feeling that ceos feel much more pressure to uh, retain the dividend um, because otherwise they would screw all their retirees uh, from before so while you're again those are outsiders i don't consider myself an outsider uh, I don't consider myself being that good in, 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 for instance, stock picking like they are. They are usually also outsider uh, afterwards, but try to find those outsiders while they are being the outsider is also really difficult, right? So um, I don't feel it's even comparison for me in the end, uh, Hussein. But technically, theoretically, yeah, dividends are less tax efficient than, than buybacks. Yeah, show me the, again. Show me the stock that we can kind of count on for the next ten years that they will increase their buybacks over time, and I'll be having a look at it. Good. I think this comes then to the end of the show for us, uh, Derek. Yeah, I mean it, it's awesome. Thanks so much to all you guys that that came on the show and asked us questions. Um, it's actually been quite fun um, doing this. Um, I enjoy actually speaking to people and, and hearing questions. Um, so we should definitely do it again but thanks so much for taking time out of your day and, and joining us this morning or this evening depending on on where you are um yeah yeah we're you. not shutting down yet feel free to stay still for 10 minutes for an after talk but to all the rest who's listening enjoy the weekend happy new year uh, don't make it too crazy don't blow your hands off because you need them to buy more dividend stocks next year and see you also derek in the next year again next week yeah see you all next year Remember, both of us at Dividend Talk are not certified financial specialists through formal education. We are just two guys sharing our journey for inspiration and entertainment purposes. Hence, this is not investment advice. Although we do our best, we can't promise that the information discussed is always correct, nor appropriate for you or anybody else. We always recommend that you do your own due diligence and be accountable for your own choices. As we always say, you can't borrow conviction from others. Last but not least, by listening to our podcast, you agree to hold us harmless from any ramifications, financial or otherwise, that occur to you as a result of acting on information provided in this podcast.